in 20th century philosophy, one of the biggest names has to be Ludwig Wittgenstein, with his logic and language games. His first book is highly technical, unapologetic, pedantic, and yet also, at times, mystical, poetic. As eccentric as its author, Wittgenstein's Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus brought him fame and global status. A decade before, in 1911, he was just a young engineer, but then, while designing propellers at college, he rethought his career. The aerodynamic calculations were such an intriguing tussle, he found himself reading books on mathematics by Frege and Bertrand Russell. What makes the whole world of numbers add up? Why do they work as they do? Because maths is founded on logic, was Gottlob Frege's groundbreaking view, and with his own form of logical notation, he tried to show this was true. A paradox spotted by Russell ruined Frege's calculations, but Russell had been equally keen to base maths on logic's foundations, and after working for years with a colleague, achieved a significant coup when, after 300 pages of logic, they proved 1 plus 1 equals 2. The above proposition is occasionally useful, was the conclusion that they drew. To the casual observer, this kind of thinking sounds crazy, round the bend, but Wittgenstein was fiercely attracted to this utopian trend, the holy grail of analysis, a method to comprehend the entire world around us with logic, the key to the door, to ground all understanding in something more concrete than ever before. Wittgenstein went to see Frege. Frege sent him to Russell who, after some doubts, recognised Ludwig's intellectual muscle. Russell's new student at Cambridge was challenging, impressive, and on logic and truth, incredibly, the pupil was more obsessive, insisting that certainty only exists in logical equations, while Russell was more content to accept empirical observations. For Wittgenstein, no, there was no such thing as a simple empirical fact, a belief he expounded passionately, although not always with tact, interrupting one lecture of Russell's to say, we cannot presume, just because we can't see it, there's no rhinoceros in this room. Chatting with Russell, a sister of Ludwig's was quite amazed to discover, the next leap in philosophy will be made by your little brother. But before any meaningful work could be done, all progress was halted by World War I. Russell was an active objector and ended up in a cell. While volunteering to fight for Austria, Ludwig went through hell. He won medals for his bravery, bullets flying in all directions, and still he kept on jotting down philosophical reflections, notes which he pulled together in the summer of 1918 into the next leap in philosophy that Russell had foreseen. Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus, as a title, sounds pretty confusing, but this cryptic Latin poses just an in-joke on Spinoza's Tractatus Theologico-Politicus, which some philosophers find amusing. It's a tract of statements, propositions, barely 70 pages long. If you think that sounds like a speedy read, you couldn't be more wrong. The statements are numbered in sequence, starting with number one. Then he has another thought on that, which he calls 1.1. The ideas that follow from 1.1 are like branches on a tree, namely 1.11, 1.12, and finally 1.13. There are seven main propositions, and it's far from easy going, not least because many branches of thought expand and keep on growing. The numbers can look a bit daunting after all the subthoughts are done. To select an example at random, there's proposition 5.47321. Helpfully, in the preface, he clarifies his objective. It's to show how limited language is, how it gives us a faulty perspective. The reason philosophy never explains as much as we think that it should is because, in Wittgenstein's words, the logic of language is misunderstood. What is the logic of language? In answer to his own query, Wittgenstein developed his so-called picture theory. The natural world and a canvas are very separate entities, but an artist's brush brings the two together, merging their identities. 
A picture's link to the world it portrays is, in many ways, quite faint. After all, one is made of real things, the other just splodges of paint. So what is the factor common to both, in reality and its reflection? How do we understand one as the other? Why do we make a connection? Wittgenstein's answer was internal structure. This is the feature they share. How objects relate with regard to each other. How they're arranged. What goes where. Real objects exist in relationships, in arrangements. That's how we survey them. And we reproduce those relationships in all our attempts to portray them. Logical form was the name that he gave to these underlying patterns, which the painter, in two dimensions, replicates and flattens. From sheep grazing in a meadow, to a ship wrecked in a storm, the real world and its depiction share the same logical form. That's also how language develops, the picture theory implies. In our spoken attempts to describe the world, a similar process applies. It's one thing to give an object a name, but a name carries no information until it's placed in a sentence, standing in relation to other words in such a way that they act as a representation of a fact or possible state of affairs, like a picture or illustration. The way we put words in a statement mirrors the world that we know. Language possesses logical form, a structure beneath the flow. The picture theory suggests we are able to look at the world and report what we see with reasonable accuracy. But the rest of human thought is, for Wittgenstein, more problematic. And, to cut a long story short, when we try to describe pure ideas in our minds or argue a point of view, we're trying to make language do something it's simply not designed to do. Propositions only have meaning when they picture a fact or event, but with philosophy and ethics, religion and aesthetics, there's no picture, there's no logical form for words to represent. So language is the wrong kind of means for expressing the speaker's intent. What is right? What is wrong? What is beautiful? Is there a God in his heaven? The answer to all such questions is in Proposition 7. In the Tractatus's very last line, the world's cut in two by Wittgenstein. When not describing facts, words are surplus to requirements. What we cannot speak about, we must pass over in silence. One reader who didn't stay silent was Russell, who told him that he was nonplussed by the suggestion that subjects like ethics simply couldn't be discussed. There was also the niggle that if one accepted Wittgenstein's methodology, the statements of logic that ruled Russell's work were quite pointless, each one a tautology. Russell helped get the book published, though it can't have been pleasant to hear he'd been wasting his time stating the obvious all the way through his career. The Tractatus itself is philosophy, so by its own rules makes no sense, a paradox Wittgenstein warmly embraced, offering no defence, only to say that if by the end you look back at all you've just read and understand what he's on about, you'll see nonsense in all that he's said. So, forget all the propositions, forget all he had to say. Having climbed the steps to understanding, now throw the ladder away.